Unit two, already, can you believe it? Earth processes. So this is the last unit that is focused solely on things other than life, okay? We do mention some things about life in here, but um, I know some of you are looking forward to getting to, you know, where are the fish, right? Where are the whales? So we're getting there. Okay, you have a question that you should be working on um, on your note packet pertaining to that map right there, and you should have done that already. Um, so let's move on, okay? So again, um, this is gonna be three parts. You can see in your notes, it's all three parts. Um, we're only gonna discuss the first part today. <clears throat> all right, you have to label these diagrams in your notes. Now, if you for some reason run out of time, um, you have to come back. Now, if you want to, you can take a quick picture. I will move out of the way. And you have five seconds to whip out your cell phones and take a quick picture of this slide. But again, the link for this video is on Google Classroom and, or you can just go to my page on YouTube. You've probably been there before and you can find this and just pause it there, okay? Because you have to label all of these, the crust, where the ocean is in comparison to the layers and where the continental shelf is versus the oceanic crust and the continental crust and the water and the mantle and stuff like that and all the little numbers and all that stuff, okay? So I know I just got in your way and you're frustrated. So come back to this. We don't have time to just sit and do that. Okay, so we are on slide three and we're talking about the theory of plate tectonics. So, and of course, all of the evidence that's supporting that theory. Evidence about geolog geology, fossils, um, paleomagnetism, even the fact that this seems to happen. So your thought question in your notes is, what are the chances? This is just a thought question. Okay, there's no right, real right or wrong way to, to answer this. That these two continents just happened to fit together exactly like puzzle, like two puzzle pieces. What forces could be responsible for the movement of such large pieces of the Earth's crust? So just a thought question, jot something really quick down there. All right. So let's find out what those answers are, okay? Drifting continents, early observations. Now we're talking about 15, uh, sorry, 500 years ago, okay? When people, humans, were just starting to go past where they felt comfortable going, right? Because, you know, 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, that whole thing. So that was, you know, right after, and the Chinese were making those routes as well, and, and um, some other um, cultures were, were putting the feelers out. And from that, navigational maps were created. And so this map maker, or Telius, that's what a cartographer is, it's a map maker. Today's map makers pretty much make everything on computers, but it's a very unique field. So he noticed how, based upon these rudimentary maps, and I want to show you one in a moment, um, he, he noticed how the continents kind of fit together like puzzle pieces. He was the first one to publish that thought. Maybe other people had the thought, but he was the first one to publish it. So he proposed that North America and South America had been separated from Europe and Africa by earthquakes and floods. Didn't exactly explain how, it was just an observation. 
So here's Ortelius's, uh, he published this world map in 1570. And you can see, there's, there's a little bit known, you know, um, <clears throat> Antarctica was rather large. Um, I think that means unknown land right there, okay? Southern unknown land. And look at the shape of South America, yikes. He had that kind of off, but you know, this whole region had been just not totally discovered. And of course this area, these areas look really good because the Chinese and other Asian cultures and European cultures, um, African cultures, they all kind of, you know, had this mapped out already. Um, Middle Eastern cultures and so on. So, but there wasn't much going on very special than him. But he saw at least this part fit in right there. And this part fit in right there. And it was just kind of amazing. And so he proposed that idea. Then, 400 some odd years later, Alfred Wegener comes along. And this is like, you know, modern times, all right? So he proposed the theory of continental drift, and he was the first one to base his theory. There were other people in between Ortelius and Wegener who based, who, who, who all, you know, went with the, the puzzle pieces fitting together. He was the first one to actually build a theory, not just a, a wild opinion, right? His theory was based on facts other than the puzzle pieces. So let's look at some of those facts, okay? Um, so this is a quote, the Earth's continents had once been joined as a single landmass that broke apart, set the continents adrift, and he called that supercontinent, and we all know the name, Pangaea. It's Greek for all Earth. And so if you look at this animation, which is not playing, oh, there it goes, I just take a moment. Okay, you can see coursing through the years, 80 million years ago, 70, 60 million years ago, and you can see the separation of the continents into the world we know today. India comes up here and hits Southern Asia. Um, and then that would be, so this is again, going all the way back to, uh, to Pangaea time and go moving forward, okay? And these are the different plates. The red lines outline the different plates. The African plate, South American plate, North American plate, Pacific plate, and so on. <clears throat> So you can see that these plates are getting larger, whereas the Pacific plate is getting smaller. All right, I think there's a question on your notes about that. So let's talk about the four different kinds of evidence. The first one is evidence from rock formations. So if, if you take samples of rocks from the Appalachian Mountains and the mountains, mountain ranges of uh, Portugal, Spain, and Northwest Africa, as well as the rocks that um, join, e so this would be North America up here, that's this region here, okay? And these rocks that South America and Africa touch, you will see um, similarities. Similarities that don't exist in, with other areas that didn't ever pr propose to be touched, okay? And um, they were able to reconstruct portions of the mountain belts of Pangaea using these similarities between, between the regions of rocks, okay? Evidence of rock formations. And you also have it if you look at the strata or the layers of the rocks. They are virtually identical with a little bit of variation um, in shape, not in type. And so they're all matching from the coast of South America to the coast of Africa. So at one time, these were one, and something occurred underneath to break that apart and push, start pushing them apart. Okay? Slide nine. Slide 10. Second evidence is from fossils. The fossils of species like the Mesosaurus. It's a freshwater, freshwater reptile. Could not swim across a salty ocean. They must have existed where the continents were touching 
because fossils were found on both continents. And if you look at these other organisms, this land reptile, the fossils are found in Madagascar, Africa, India, and Antarctica, so they must have all been touching. Um, another one over here, another land reptile between Africa and South America. And what's really interesting is this plant, the Glossopterus, because it spans all of these. And here is that same species Glossopterus of uh, plant that is climate evidence as well. So species, fossils like this have been found in Antarctica where there are no plants like this. No, there are tiny mosses and algae and things, but there are no really leafy plants right now down there. Maybe in the future when the ice melts and it gets warmer, um, possibly. But having fossils of, of this kind found on all of those different continents means at one time they were all similar temperature and therefore and touching. They, this plant couldn't have existed otherwise. So they, they, when the continents were closer, they were in a temperate climate closer to the equator. <clears throat> and then the final piece of evidence is paleomagnetism. Now we talked a little bit about this in our create a, an experiment last week, okay? When we uh, were trying to, to design a way to see if seafloor spreading over the Atlantic Ocean was either slowing down, remaining constant or static, or, or speeding up, okay? And so that's, a lot of us focused on the paleomagnetism, which means as, we're gonna watch a whole video on this, as the seafloor spreads, the new magma that rises up cools and aligns itself with the polarity of the planet. The North and South Pole. And according to paleomagnetism, drilling down into the ocean floor and taking samples, they can see that every hundred thousand years or so, the poles of the Earth rotate. They flip. I don't mean that the whole planet flips over. I mean that the North Pole, the magnetic North Pole, trades places with the magnetic South Pole. So all your magnets will point the, wrong, the other direction. We just have to make uh, compasses. We have to, have to make new compasses, okay? Um, and it's already starting to happen. We'll talk about it uh, later on. But once we were able to, to figure this out and drill holes, this was a huge piece of the puzzle about seafloor spreading, about um, plate tectonics, okay? Speaking of seafloor spreading, this guy came in in 1962, about 50 years later, and he came up, he wrote a book called The History of Ocean Basins, and he proposed a theory called, this is Harry H. Hess, seafloor spreading. And this is seafloor spreading in motion. Um, so you can see that something is causing these plates to move apart and, and make new magma come up right here, which cools and makes new rock and spreads this out, making new seafloor. And islands and underwater mountain chains and then other things, earthquakes, tsunamis and stuff like that. Okay, so if we look on the next, on the next slide, we're gonna find out what's going on here. Slide 15, so as you know, heat rises, just like hot air rises, hot water rises, hot magma rises. So the core of the earth is producing this heat which is keeping the melted, the rock, molten around much of the inside of the planet. And if hot rises, cold sinks. And so as the magma rises, it moves the plates above it in very measurable ways. And these are called convection currents. So the hot air, the hot magma, sorry, is going up, cools down, heats up, goes up, cools down, heats, goes up, cools down, sinks, and so on and so forth. 
and it's happening everywhere, some places more than others, like Iceland and Hawaii, for example, those are hot spots. That's where there's no fracture in the surface, but a convection current is coming up and meeting at the top in the middle of a plate, essentially melting a hole in it. And um, that's what's happening in Hawaii. In Iceland, however, that's happening right on the, the plate boundary. So check this out. Here you've got powerful sub-Earth rising heat, rising molten magma, which is pushing those plates apart, pushing them apart and making them move in opposite directions. And this is popping up here only in small, compared to this, only in small parts, and it's making new earth, along, I mean, new ground right along there, pushing these apart. It's very powerful convection currents. And this is where one plate maybe beats another plate and gets recycled back into it again. If you saw that, it comes over here, and old crust, in some places, not everywhere, not in the Atlantic Ocean typically, in the Pacific more, um, you see this old crust can sometimes meet another plate and dive below it and get recycled back again. So the whole process is a recycling process of convection currents. <clears throat> Okay, slide 17. So now we're on talking about where these plates meet together. And they're called plate boundaries. And there's three different kinds. Convergent, to converge. Divergent, to diverge, come apart. And transform, to slide past one another, okay? So here you have the divergent boundary defined for you. And at a divergent boundary, the plates separate because of those convection currents, like we said. So you've got these convection currents down here pushing apart these plates. We, we've just discussed this, okay? So this is seafloor spreading as an example. The mid-Atlantic ridge and other mid-ocean ridges are an example. So um, <clears throat> that's it. That's, we, we kind of Discuss that at length right there, okay? And those, you can see the layers superimposed on top from your previous diagram um, earlier in the notes. Let's wait till it starts over again, just so you can get an idea of what's going on. So this is, is the ocean. This is the crust, or, um, oops, also called the lithosphere, okay? But this is the outer lithosphere, okay, the ocean floor. Lithosphere, and then this is the magma down here, or the asthenosphere. Okay. Slide 18. The second one, convergent boundaries. And this was the other side of, so the convection is coming up and coming this way, right? And it's moving that plate toward another plate, where two plates are coming together now. They're converging right, right here. And it's, it's plates colliding, and you're squeezing and compressing the rock here. So what does that do? It makes it crumple. It crumples. It's called subduction, where one goes underneath the other. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they'll go like this and ride up on each other, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, so this creates all kinds of features, including mountain chains, like the Andes Mountains in South America, uh, and volcanoes, definitely earthquakes, tsunamis, all of those things. And this rubbing here creates friction, heat, um, cracks in the earth, so magma will rise up there and make volcanoes. So it's pretty neat. This is the, it's pretty much the entire western coast of South America. Is, this is happening too. So here is where I said they come together and one doesn't go under the other like this, not subduction. Here is where they just, like two cars crashing into each other head on and their front ends just crumple and go, you know, get wrinkled. That's what's happening when India crashes into southern Asia. They, it wrinkles up both ends 
making very high mountains, the highest terrestrial land mountains on the whole planet, and that's the, um, the Himalayan mountains, and that's where Mount Everest is, right there. Because you're not, getting, you're not getting this underneath and pushing up, you're getting this where both push up. Crumple zone. And the last one is the transform boundary. Transform is where you've got sliding and horizontally. It causes the rocks to break as they grind past one another. So here, um, you've got the convection currents making these diverge, okay, as well as these. But sometimes you'll get a horizontal crack between two of them. And so as these are moving apart, these two are sliding past one another, and that's a transform fault, okay? Oh, there's an animation there. I thought it was supposed to move. <clears throat> Let's watch that for a second. One more time. Everybody, eyes up here. Maybe. There. All right, that was strange. Stranger still, okay. So now we're talking about what things, what um, features are made by these three different types of plate boundaries. So we're gonna talk about trenches, mid-ocean ridges, which we've talked about, something called hydrothermal vents, we mentioned that as well when we talked about increasing salinity of the water. Abyssal plains, that's the flat, deep regions over uh, oceanic crust. That's in between two fault lines. Volcanoes, earthquakes, and tsunamis. Okay, so at a divergent, coming apart, divergent boundary, you're going to get all types of things. Like I said, hydrothermal vents, abyssal plains. I'm going to define all these as pictures in your notes. Um, Volcanoes, obviously, something called a submarine volcano. Earthquakes, because every time the land moves, the, quake, the earth is going to quake. And, of course, we're creating new crust here. So, and you've got seismic um, sensors that tell us when these things are happening. Pretty much all over the planet, there are seism seismometers everywhere and in, in, at the, in the oceans and stuff like that. Just for warning. So, I want to show you this in, in an actual video. Here, let's make sure the volume is turned up. All the way. <clears throat> this is the moment that a volcano erupts underneath the sea. Although relatively little is known about them, it's believed there are over one million submarine volcanoes, largely located along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. sight from above the water, and here's a rare glimpse of an eruption beneath the waves. These volcanoes are responsible for producing 75% of the Earth's magma. Underwater volcanoes are understood to work like their counterparts on dry land. They form towering mountains submerged well below sea level, some reported to rise as much as 10,000 feet above the seabed. While it's relatively rare to see, these eruptions can also create new islands above the water. On November 14, 1963, a trawler sailing just south of Iceland noticed a plume of smoke billowing from the sea. Thinking it was a fire on board another ship, they traveled towards what was, in fact, an underwater volcano erupting and witnessed the birth of a new island. It was named Surtsey, after fire giants of Norse mythology. No close approach to the crater seemed possible. It belched lava at the rate of half a million tons an hour. Ships and planes were warned to give it a wide berth.
Atlantic islands like it had been thrown up before in recent times, but not for a thousand years has one of this magnitude survived. The lava which once spilled over the yellow rim still bubbles angrily. The liquid lake is 300 feet below now, but jets of bright red lava still spurt upwards, and the fumes are intense. The mountains thrown up from the sea less than a year and a half ago look as though they've weathered the passage of centuries. But the dust piled up round the plane wheels in our absence show how swiftly the pattern of nature is still changing here. Today, the island of Circe is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and the only people allowed to set foot on it are the scientists studying the ecosystem and geology of this unspoiled isle. It's thought that Iceland itself was created in this way by underwater volcanoes millions of years ago. So while it may be rare to see one erupt, these submarine volcanoes have a big part to play in shaping the world above water. Remember, convergent is where they converge or come together. You're going to get trenches. So where one subducts under the other, it's going to watch this hand, okay? Coming across, here's the oceanic plate, here's the um, continental plate. This is going to come over here and strike it, but not go up. Like it's going to go, it's going to push it down, friction, and push mountains up over here. So this would be like the Andes Mountains in South America. And this is a trench. So that's the trenches that we're talking about. And of course, volcanoes, wherever their plates meet, you're going to get earthquakes. And wherever you get earthquakes underwater, you're going to get those tsunamis, okay? Um, and of course, a loss of crust, because either they're gonna go up, and so you're getting vertical rather than horizontal land, or the crust gets recycled back into the magma and the asthenosphere again. Okay. A tragic scene, entire cities flooded, entire towns inundated, an unending stream of floating debris. Buildings, cars, people swept away in an unstoppable wave. It's a brutal reminder. Tsunamis are dangerous and unpredictable. But what causes these giant waves and what can be done to minimize their impact? Tsunamis can strike with little warning because they're usually triggered by a sudden displacement of ocean water, like volcanic eruptions, landslides, meteorites, or the most common culprit, earthquakes. In the deep ocean, a typical tsunami wave is barely noticeable and poses little threat. But the waves can spread out thousands of miles, rolling across the ocean at speeds up to 600 miles per hour. As the rolling water reaches the shoreline, the wave's friction against the shallower floor slows it down and raises its height. By the time it reaches the shore, the wave can be as tall as 100 feet. Unlike ordinary waves, a tsunami wave doesn't crest and break. Instead, it moves forward like a solid wall of water that crashes over the coastline, obliterating almost everything in its path. And just when you think the danger is over, it recedes, dragging everything back to the ocean. Tsunamis have multiple waves, which can continue to hit the shore for several hours, causing even more destruction. The word tsunami originates from Japan, a country that sits on a geographic location that makes it an easy target for these natural disasters. In 2011, it was struck by a tsunami that claimed nearly 16,000 lives. But the deadliest tsunami in history is believed to be the Indian Ocean Tsunami of 2004. The U.S. Geological Survey estimated that tsunami released the energy equivalent of 23,000 Hiroshima-type atomic bombs. An earthquake created an estimated 600-mile rupture on the ocean floor. This caused the tsunami to form and then travel at the speed of a jetliner, reaching over 11 countries, traveling over 3,000 miles, killing more than 220,000 people. Because they can strike so quickly with such deadly force, tsunami warning centers around the globe are on constant alert, monitoring underwater earthquakes large enough to trigger massive waves. Their ultimate goal is to alert vulnerable coastlines and give residents time to seek higher ground before a tsunami hits. 
And the last one is the transform boundary. Transform where the sliding again is um, creating earthquakes and of course fault lines. So we're gonna learn a little bit about earthquakes now. From above, the planet appears eerily still. But every mountain range and every chasm on its face is a scar with many telling a story of when the earth rumbled to life. Earthquakes occur around the world. They've been recorded on all seven continents, but most quakes take place in just three regions. The Mid-Atlantic Ridge, an underwater line that runs down the Atlantic Ocean, the Alpine Belt, which stretches from the Mediterranean to Southeast Asia, and the Circum-Pacific Belt, which traces along the edges of the Pacific Ocean and is where about 80% of all earthquakes occur. These areas experience the most earthquakes due to what lies beneath the surface. Earthquakes are the result of pressure, specifically pressure caused by extreme stress in the Earth's crust. That stress can be caused by volcanic activity or even man-made activities in certain areas. However, most earthquake-inducing stress is caused by the movement of tectonic plates. Tectonic plates are constantly moving, either against, away, along, or underneath each other. But sometimes, their edges may catch and stick. The plates, however, continue to move, or at least attempt to. Energy from this attempted movement builds around the edge's sticking point, creating immense pressure until the edges are forced to let go and the plates slip. This causes a sudden and powerful release of energy, so powerful that it breaks the Earth's crust. This fracturing emits shock waves through the ground and causes intense vibrations or quakes. In fact, the world's most earthquake-prone regions are where the most geologically active plates meet. Earthquakes, or any seismic activity, are recorded by seismographs. When the ground shakes, seismographs oscillate, drawing a jagged line to reflect this movement. The more extreme the earthquake, the greater the height of the jagged line. These recorded motions are then used to measure the earthquake's strength or magnitude. While several scales of magnitude exist, the one seismologists prefer is the moment magnitude scale. It has no upper limit and it measures earthquakes logarithmically. This means that each magnitude on its scale is 10 times greater than the one before it. Unlike the now rarely used Richter scale, the moment magnitude scale can be applied globally and can measure quakes of the highest magnitudes. The largest recorded earthquake occurred near Valdivia, Chile in 1960. Nestled within the Circum-Pacific Belt, the Valdivia earthquake was the most powerful in a series of quakes that struck the region, measuring at a magnitude of about 9.5. In addition to causing devastating tremors on land, the earthquake also generated a deadly tsunami reaching up to 80 feet high. The tsunami raced across the Pacific Ocean, hitting faraway countries like the Philippines and Japan. In fact, data from seismographs show that the shock waves emitted by the Valdivia earthquake continued to shake the entire planet for days. Some earthquake-prone areas have adapted various ways to protect their communities. Buildings and bridges are designed to sway rather than break when an earthquake occurs. The public is educated on how to protect themselves during a seismic event, and government officials enact drills to ensure the protection of their people. Earthquakes can leave behind incredible devastation, but these same forces have also created magnificent features, with each adding character to a planet so unique. Okay, so here we are on slide 27. I believe it's only 30 slides. 
So this is hydrothermal vents. So the next few slides talk about um, this very unique feature that was only discovered relatively recently um, in, in my lifetime um, at the bottom of the sea because we've developed the technology to be able to go down there and explore. So you have to label the, the parts, a couple missing parts um, in your notes from this diagram, okay? So um, one, you have to know that um, the vent is under, under pressure. It's just water seeping down and dissolving metals in the crust as it does so. That water gets superheated from magma pockets that are relatively close to you know, thinner crust, closer to the ocean. And so that, it's not magma coming out of here. This is not a volcano. It's, it's the heat raising the temperature of that seeping in seawater so high. Remember, the higher the temperature, the higher the solubility of dissolved solids. So you're raising this temperature to beyond you know, the norm, and you're therefore able to dissolve all sorts of different solutes in that water. Um, copper, zinc, iron, sulfur, sodium, calcium, potassium um, are all dissolved in there. And so as that superheated fluid rises up, it breaks through the surfaces under a lot of pressure, and that rich nutrient soup, much hotter than soup, okay, super hot, boils out. And an entire ecosystem, which we'll talk about in the future, of organisms that base themselves on the chemicals rather than, for, for energy, rather than the sun, because these things exist in the abyssal zone, the bottom of the ocean where there's no light, and so there's no photosynthesis. So how does life exist? It's called chemosynthesis, okay? If you missed that, you'll have to come back to it. Now, this um, animation is somehow running backwards. <laughs> That is really strange. It's supposed to be running forward. That is the weirdest thing I've ever seen an animation do. So these, what are called black smokers, you can see it looks like black smoke and if it wasn't water, it would, it would be, if it was like this was in the air. But this is extremely hot water full of all of these dissolved minerals coming out of these vents. This is a probe that's like measuring the temperature and measuring the, um, the, the salinity and other things. And so this is a probe arm coming from an ROV, a remotely operated vehicle. Again, don't know why this is going backwards, but it's like supposed to be coming out of there at a very high speed. <clears throat> Now, one of the um, goals of these notes is to, uh, let, is to inform you that these hydrothermal vents don't have to be discovered by looking at them. They can use remote sensors that hover from a distance above the, the water. They don't have to go all the way down to the bottom. And what they use, they use these cameras and lasers um, to sense a plume, a hydrothermal vent plume from far away, from a farther distance. And then it gives you readouts like this. So here, this is called a Mid-Atlantic Black Smoker Simulation. Um, and so it's almost like a infrared readout, sort of, and it's giving you even from far away or near the surface, it's giving you the location on the ocean floor where the magma source is, and therefore, and the temperatures of the water above it 
so they could find these hydrothermal vents from far away. So they're just using remotely operated vehicles, ROVs, um, to, or this is actually an AUV, an autonomous underwater vehicle, it's pre-programmed to travel a certain distance and a certain depth without being um, tethered or even remote controlled. It's just programmed and it goes by itself. It's pretty, like a, like a Roomba. You know, no one sits with a remote control and controls a Roomba. You program it beforehand and it does its thing. Very similar, probably, technology to that. Okay? And then finally, on the last slide, uh, in your notes, there should be a stop sign as well. Um, explain how the chimney forms. So this, this is not called um, a volcano. It's still called a vent, but um, on volcanoes, they don't call them chimneys, but on uh, hydrothermal vents, they do, okay? How it forms, including reference to temperature and solubility of salts. So this is the main information here, down here. But these are just some diagrams. I believe I incorporated this one into your notes. Um, so the temperature near the seafloor, remember, that thermocline, right? The temperature is warm, and then it drops through the thermocline, and then it slowly drops as it goes to the bottom. All that immense pressure and lack of solar energy are making the floor at, in the sea, the water at the seafloor, very cold. Only two degrees above freezing. But the water coming out of these vents, these chimneys, is about three to 400 degrees Celsius. That is beyond boiling, because water boils at 100 degrees. So it's the extreme pressure that keeps it from, from turning into a gas. But it cools off rather rapidly. As the distance increases from the vent, see it's coming out, it's bringing all of these rich minerals, which rain down on the outer parts, and it builds up just like a volcano, okay? Um, and the farther away you go from the vent, the, so well, the water's warm here, but it cools off drastically back to, ne to uh, approximately that little squiggly line, um, that's, called an, that's how you abbreviate the word approximately. So it means around, approximately. So it goes back to approximately two degrees Celsius not very far from the edge. So the only life, which we'll talk about in the future, we're not talking about that just yet, will be found right around the vents. And the farther away you get, you're not going to get um, hydrothermal life. You'll get other living things that live in cold water, but not that. So no light and the surrounding water is near freezing the farther away you get, okay? And here we're showing Again, it's pretty much what we saw before. Um, I think the other picture was actually a better representation. But here you have this 350 degree isotherm. An isotherm is very much like a thermocline, um, but it's a line that delineates um, change in temperature in uh, atmosphere, or in this case, in the rock itself, okay? so. And the, so remember, the water is coming through and picking up all of those minerals, all of those salts. And remember, the higher the temperature, the more it can dissolve. So by the time it gets to pass that isotherm of 350 degrees Celsius, you're at a max. And so you have pulled in all of these precip all of these. Um, dissolved minerals, which the farther away it goes out, the temperature drops. And we learned that the, the cooler the water, the less solutes it can hold, solid solutes. And that's why it rains out. It's called fallout over the side. And that those chemicals that are down from inside the earth, they are helping to keep these hydrothermic animals alive, which we're going to learn about, okay? So that's part one. There's three parts.